Welcome. Uh, this is uh, building large-scale private clouds with OpenStack and Ceph. Just checking you're in the right room. Yeah. Should we kick off? All right. Yeah. Cool. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm uh, Andrew Mitri. It's Hi. Anton Thacker. Um, we're, we're from Walmart. Um, uh, maybe uh, we'll tell you a little bit since uh, we're here in Spain about who is or uh, what is Walmart. Uh, Walmart is a uh, is this uh, retail store. It was started in 1962 by Sam Walton. Uh, today it is actually Fortune One, the world's largest company, at 11,500 stores, under 72 banners in 28 countries, and with e-commerce websites in 11 countries. For for those of you in the, um, the EU, um, Walmart owns Asda in England. Uh, might be a familiar brand. Uh, we have over 100 distribution centers worldwide and over 2 million employees. We are the largest private employer in the world. Uh, and we have about 80 million uh, monthly walmart.com visitors. Um, so uh, we wanted to share with you a little bit about where we are today with OpenStack and with Ceph. So I'll, I'm going to kick off the OpenStack part, and then I'm going to hand off to Anton to go deep on what we're doing with Ceph. Uh, so our current OpenStack uh, footprint is over 170K uh, CPU cores, and it's growing. Uh, we're in about six data centers, uh, and we have about 20 to 30 regions um, across those six data centers. Uh, we use uh, OpenStack Ansible uh, for deploying and managing our OpenStack. We actually have uh, um, a core, two core contributors on OpenStack Ansible, uh, Jimmy McQuarrie and Michael Gugino, um, uh, and our production is currently running on OpenStack Liberty. Besides uh Contributing to OpenStack, we also contribute to Ceph. We actually are uh, number 16 contributor for the next uh, uh, Ceph release, uh, which is really exciting. I think we're, uh, yeah, we think we have about uh, four or five uh, developers that are actually contributing code to Ceph right now. We also have a, a core on OpenStack Watcher, and we contribute on quite a few other uh, OpenStack projects, both code, documentation, bug fixes, and we participate in uh, various working groups as well. Um, so as part of the cloud team at Walmart, we actually have uh, uh, um, a, a platform, an application lifecycle management tool, uh, a company we bought a few years ago called OneOps. Uh, we've now open sourced that tool about a year ago. Uh, and that is actually how our developers interact with the cloud infrastructure at Walmart. Um, uh, and to give you a couple of stats, uh, our developers through OneOps are leveraging those 170K cores that we have. They do about 100,000 what we call auto repairs, where um, OneOps allows our applications to self-heal. If a VM has an issue, it can automatically replace um, or repair those issues. Uh, we do about 40,000 deployments a month. Um, we have about 3,000 applications running uh, through OneOps on OpenStack. And we support, um, so in OneOps we have a concept of a pack, uh, which makes it easier for our developers to deploy various technologies. And we support about 60 different open source technologies through those packs. Uh, you see some of them listed there on the screen. Um, so when we started off doing OpenStack, um, uh, we actually did it only with ephemeral storage, local disk. Um, uh, the idea being, hey, it's a cloud app. It should be able to run with ephemeral only. Um, and in theory, that might sound good. Um, and we did do a lot, uh, you know, moved a lot of our e-commerce e workload over that way. Uh, but we, we quickly found uh, a few uh, non-ideal states being in an ephemeral-only world. Uh, one is that our CPU and memory needs scale differently than the local disk. So that ends up with standard storage, both in capacity and performance. Um, and uh, it also increased our recovery on some of our app uh, time when we had to rebuild that uh, on a local disk. Um, and also, I didn't give a lot of avenues for uh, applications that weren't fully cloud native. Yeah. So um, let's talk about uh, why we would need uh, persistent storage. Um, one of our big use cases uh, is like uh, traditional type applications like uh, RDBMS type applications. Um, and uh, when I think about persistent storage in the cloud, um, I in my mind, I, I split it up into three groups, um, and we'll, I'll try to talk about all three of those in this presentation. So we have uh, traditional uh, block storage for virtual machines. 
Um, I think everybody probably understands that if you guys already run uh, Ceph, I think it's easy to understand that. Um, what I call uh, traditional object storage, uh, and it's like for, for various um, object type uh, applications, and um, uh, I think that's also self-explanatory. But I, one other uh, type that I'm gonna talk about, and uh, for us right now, that's a big use case, is uh, large scale object storage specifically uh, for uh, big data workloads. Um, so I'll try to, uh, we'll, we'll try to cover all those uh, uh, in this presentation. Um, so uh, some of the things that uh, we've done in the past with, uh, with Ceph um, is we've actually gone with um, very dense um, uh, storage nodes. Um, so this was, um, I'm not gonna name uh, specific vendors, but you can probably guess who it is. Um, so these are like uh, boxes that had uh, 72 uh, uh, large form factor spinning drives in them. And uh, when you have so many uh, disks in a node, you uh, end up having uh, what I would call challenges. Um, one specific one is uh, for Ceph is uh, we ended up having like 130 or 140,000 uh, threads on the box. And when you have that many threads, uh, all kinds of interesting uh, things uh, started, start to show up in the, in the Linux kernel. Uh, there's all kinds of um, NUMA, uh, NUMA issues on the box. Um, there's uh, just uh, like uh, scheduling issues with the Linux scheduler, all kinds of stuff. And if you're using um, uh, very dense uh, disks, you actually end up with a, with a box that has like maybe half a petabyte of storage in one server. So unless, um, you, you can probably still do this, but this is something that we're not doing right now. Um, you, you can probably do this if you have literally thousands of servers like this, but we're not quite at that scale, even though we're pretty big, we're not that big um, uh, for, for, for dense uh, storage. So um, and I would say unless you have over 200 boxes in a cluster like this, I, or maybe even more, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't recommend going something like this. Um, something that we're also not doing anymore um, is spinning drives for block storage. Uh, uh, SSDs, uh, SSD prices have come down in price quite, quite dramatically. So um, we actually uh, started doing uh, 2x replication instead of 3x replication. And because we're not buying very expensive uh, like 10K or 15K disks, uh, actually our price per gig uh, has uh, not really gone up. In fact, it's actually gone down going from uh, 3x replication to 2x replication with, uh, with solid state drives. So we've actually been able to transition to solid state drives without really uh, setting off a lot of uh, alarm bells um, in, the, uh, in the finance department. For, for block storage work? For, this, is for, this is only for block storage, yes. Uh, I think for, um, uh, for object storage, um, for large scale object storage. Large scale object storage, uh, the like the, the 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 access the disk access patterns are are such that you can actually get away with um, uh, spinning disks. And of course, it's it's kind of, it is expensive to buy all flash uh, for for large quantities. Um, so the other thing is, uh, unfortunately, sometimes we do have to uh, build small clusters, but I try to avoid that at, at all costs. Ceph really um, performs better when it's uh, at scale, so. Uh, we've had uh, server, uh, uh, clusters in the past where we had like maybe six or ten nodes, and uh, that's not a lot of fun if you're doing interesting things. So what is the minimum size cluster you'd recommend? Um, so right now I think our, our minimum size in production is 16 nodes, mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's, I, I, I would shy away from anything smaller than that, in my opinion, because if you have a single node failure, with uh, like 10 nodes or something like that, you're really affecting more than 10% of, uh, of your cluster capacity. Uh, you lose uh, uh, actual capacity in terms of uh, space, and you lose, of course, uh, performance. And obviously, you're going to be moving and shuffling data back and forth. Uh, that's going to, you know, that's going to impact uh, your your cluster. Uh, so this is actually our current um, uh, all SSD uh, Ceph cluster configuration. I unfortunately can't give you. Um, the uh, more specifics than that, but I think you can probably guess this isn't very cutting edge, uh, and uh, this isn't very anything secret. So yeah, well, many server manufacturers. Have some yeah, awesome. yeah. This is this is traditional kind of like tier one server manufacturers. Um, so we we actually we do try to limit the RAM. Uh, I mean, some maybe somebody will say that 128 gig is a lot, but actually we've scaled that down from uh, larger uh, sizes. Um, 
right now we're doing uh, 24 physical cores, and unfortunately right now that's uh, two sockets. So these are 12 core CPUs, and effectively with hyper-threading that gives you um, uh, 48 threads. Um, because of our existing uh, data center footprint uh, for uh, the current production stuff that we have, uh, that's going to be, uh, you know, if you ever walk into a, a Walmart store or, uh, or if you decide to buy something online from walmart.com, um, this is mostly, you know, a lot of applications are going to be hitting something, something that's on this right now. So unfortunately, we were um, limited by 10 gigabit Ethernet. Uh, so we're doing ten, a dual 10 gig Ethernet, so uh, one uh, network for uh, front-end connectivity for all the Ceph clients, and the second uh, NIC uh, for the back-end uh, network for Ceph for replication. Um, so we're doing, right now we're doing 10 uh, SATA SSD drives. Uh, uh, primarily it's uh, because of, we, we couldn't get a better chassis uh, in time when, when we needed to order stuff, and we're trying to change that a little bit. Um, and we're using, in addition to uh, 10 SSD drives, we're actually uh, using an additional uh, NVMe device uh, for journaling. So we're actually not doing journaling on the uh, bulk SSD storage. Um, the primary reason for uh, NVMe uh, device is actually for lower, lower latency. Uh, as if you're familiar with Ceph, I'm sure you know this, but um, uh, Ceph doesn't acknowledge the, uh, the right until um, the, the data has been uh, placed into the Ceph journal um, and on, you know, on, on all replicas uh, in the cluster. So, so if you're doing a lot of uh, uh, low Q-depth uh, type uh, write workload, um, you're going to see uh, higher latency until that data is flushed into the non-volatile memory um, device. Um, the other thing that uh, a separate NVMe device allows us for journaling is um, we can actually uh, try to uh, get cheaper SSDs that have uh, lower endurance. Um, so we're still, that's still a work in progress, and I'll, I'll talk about that uh, a little bit more. But um, uh, that's, that's basically our, our current config right now. Not really anything uh, cutting edge, uh, but, uh, but this does um, uh, provide us uh, with the performance that we need, uh, and it's got a, uh, um, a good enough capacity so that we can scale the cluster horizontally more than, uh, more than vertically. What's the ballpark performance you're getting out of a cluster? So uh, my benchmark uh, performance is uh, two to 3,000 IOPS per uh, OSD, per, per SSD. Uh, this, is, um, uh, this is performance that you should get uh, out of the cluster. Um, so some people will say that that's, that sucks, that's, that's not a lot. Uh, but if you actually look at uh, dollars per gig, if you look at dollars per IOP, um, we actually, I, I think that we, we have a pretty uh, compelling uh, solution. And uh, if you compare it to a traditional type, um, uh, you know, enterprise storage or something like that. Um, so I, again, I, I don't have um, specific pricing, uh, but, uh, but it's, I mean, you can guess probably how much this is. Um, so some of the issues that we currently have that we want to solve. Um, uh, so we, we, like I said before, we are, we're, do, we're using dual, uh, dual CPU sockets, and uh, that creates a lot of NUMA issues. Uh, so NUMA stands for non-uniform memory access, but basically what it means uh, is um, you actually, uh, with traditional Intel architectures, you can't access uh, everything uh, from anywhere in the system. So if you have a process that runs on the, on the Linux uh, operating system, that process uh, is typically tied to a specific uh, CPU socket. Um, and if that process needs some resource within the same server, but that resource sits uh, somewhere else in the system, for example, on a different CPU socket, you're actually going to be traversing the, uh, uh, across the, the two CPU sockets, the, the NUMA bus. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of interesting, uh, depending on how far you push your uh, Linux server, there's a lot of interesting issues that uh, you can start uh, having on the system. Uh, Samsung uh, recently, I think uh, this summer, published an interesting white paper on there. Uh, they had a, a reference architecture box with um, uh, 24 NVMe uh, drives. And um, the box had two CPUs, but they, they designed the box to have everything uh, kind of balanced between the first socket and the second socket. And um, uh, they, they did a lot of tuning, and I think they were able to scale 
uh, an additional, uh, if I remember correctly, 20 to 30 percent um, in performance just by uh, properly tuning uh, all of the uh, uh, NUMA type things that they could have tuned on the box. Um, even if you're doing uh, like very small uh, IO workloads, um, uh, IO size workloads, um, we found that 10 gigabit Ethernet is actually can potentially be a bottleneck. Um, it certainly is a bottleneck for Ceph if you're doing uh, uh, recovery. Uh, if you have a node that failed, all of a sudden you have to shuffle all this uh, data around. Um, so, uh, so there's um, so we're actually looking at uh, going going to something faster. Um, in the past, we've done with the with the very dense 72 drive chassis, we've done uh, 40 gigabit Ethernet, but uh, we're actually looking at um, 25 gigabit uh, for our next uh, uh, build out. Um, 25 gigabit. Um, is much easier on the networking guys because you can take a 100 gigabit port and split it into uh, four uh, 25 gigabit ports. Um, the other thing that, uh, oh, so uh, the current solution that we have is um, unfortunately it's using two different um, disk controllers. So we couldn't get um, a controller that had um, uh, all 10 drives. So we have like, it's, it's a weird number. I think it's like eight disks and two disks are in a different controller. So uh, it's not ideal um, for, uh, because we're scaling, we're, we try to scale more horizontally. We actually are not running into controller performance issues. So we actually uh, want to go with uh, a single controller uh, and potentially maybe more, more disks. Um, and uh, that brings me to my last point on the slide is um, traditional server vendors, in my opinion, um, are are not innovative enough. Um, uh, so we're looking at uh, some less traditional uh, server vendors, uh, some ODMs that uh, can provide these solutions. Some of them are on the floor at this conference. Um, so, uh, so some of the things that we want to try in the future, and we've already, like, we've, we've started doing this in the lab, but, um, uh, you know, I didn't want to uh, present something that wasn't true, so uh, this isn't actually in production right now. So we want to use a single socket. Um, with uh, uh, the uh, V4 Xeon processors, um, you can actually get uh, enough uh, CPU cores now that you can um, uh, you can get enough CPU processing power that Ceph needs uh, with just a single socket. Um, uh, we're we're not doing uh, the, the t highest end uh, CPU uh, bins. Uh, I think we're we're not we don't need that much performance. And also, as you as you get up to like the highest end of the CPU. Uh, spectrum and from from Intel solutions, um, uh, you you end up paying a lot more per core than than something in the middle. So we're sort of somewhere in the middle. Um, you guys can ask me later what it is. Uh, so we are looking at uh, all the NVMe chassis, um, and uh, we're kind of uh, we we've, we've we we're waiting for uh, the solutions that come out from AMD. So AMD is uh, AMD is a Zen architecture. Um, they have um, uh, a solution that's supposed to come out next year where there's going to be more PCI lanes uh, per socket than what Intel has to offer. So we're, we're looking at that uh, potentially maybe not for next year but the year after that um, to see if, um, if maybe that will make more sense. But uh, NVMe prices have come down already at this point. You can buy uh, NVMe drives for essentially the same thing as a, as a SATA drive. Uh, but NVMe uh, gives you... Um, more, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot more bandwidth. The, the protocol that you use to talk to the actual uh, flash media is, is completely different and it's a lot more efficient. I'm sure you guys uh, are aware of this. Um, so uh, another thing that we want to try is actually to use, to try to use lower ender, endurance flash. Um, so in traditional uh, storage, uh, you guys are aware of like storage tiering or storage caching for, um, you know, to serve hotter data versus colder data, because uh, not all of your, you know, not your entire cluster is not going to be hot all the time, right? So, I want to try to try to take that approach, but I'll, but uh, apply it to flash endurance, and um, we're 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 testing things uh, with uh, with some of the caching technologies. Um, so maybe maybe next summit we'll be able to present something uh, that's going to be. Um, uh, compelling. Um, we're looking at uh, things like single power supply, uh, just simpler servers, um, because um, it just doesn't make sense. Why do we need uh, dual power supplies? If we're going to have a massive data center failure, um, 
we'll just let the whole data center die. Um, so, so it doesn't really make sense to pay extra for, for uh, dual power supplies. Um, I don't know actually if we've settled on this design or not, but uh, I think it also depends on what data center it is, and uh, of course it depends on uh, the scale of your, of your subcluster. Um, we do want to take uh, fail in place uh, into the design of the architecture. Um, so right now we're sort of doing that already just because we don't have time to go and fix every, uh, every um, potential uh, failed drive in the, in the cluster. Uh, so we just kind of let things uh, fail in place, but we want to take that to the next level and actually uh, properly uh, plan for that. Um, and maybe have like a uh, once a year, um, you know, drive replacement party or something like that. Um, so, and then, yeah, and also we're, we're trying to, as, uh, as Ceph matures, uh, as Blue Store uh, comes into uh, production, uh, maybe next release, um, uh, we, uh, we're looking at seeing if we can potentially lower the CPU count to save on power and save on, on cost, of course. Um, so just uh, the, the current challenges that we have with uh, block storage on Ceph, serving OpenStack specifically, of course. Um, uh, so uh, low latency for small Q-depth uh, workloads. So basically, uh, if you have a traditional RDBMS type application, um, uh, your network storage, right, you're, you're gonna be a little bit more sensitive to, uh, uh, to uh, low latency, uh, to, to, to higher latency uh, uh, from your storage. Um, we're having uh, some challenges right now with uh, automation. So we've, we've standardized on uh, Ceph Ansible for uh, the build out of uh, our Ceph clusters and uh, uh, raise of hands who is using Ceph Ansible right now. Anybody? All right, so a few people. Um, so we're still uh, working on the tooling for, um, uh, for things like replacement of a node, replacement of a disk, uh, rolling upgrades of a cluster. Um, uh, in my opinion, uh, the, the stuff that's there right now in the project is, is not quite um, uh, what, what we need, so we're still kind of working on that, and perhaps, um, uh, hopefully, not perhaps, but hopefully we'll, uh, we'll contribute back to the community. Um, uh, so um, some of the things that we've hit very recently with, uh, with bugs, uh, so we're using um, uh, Ubuntu 16.04 right now, um, and uh, there was a a uh, very nasty Xenial uh, kernel bug where it was like a divide by zero bug that was affecting specifically uh, the, whatever the Ceph OSDs were doing. So we, we kept having these crazy uh, crashes uh, where, where an OSD dies, and that's not a big deal, but then uh, that box sort of slowly becomes more and more uh, unusable. Um, uh, so we had to, we were forced to like reboot servers all the time. Um, so that thankfully that's been fixed uh, if you're running the latest kernel. Um, there's a current bug, um, and I think that's been confirmed, but we, at least we've confirmed it in our environment, uh, and we have a developer that's sort of uh, trying to figure this out right now. Uh, so there's an RBD uh, cache. Uh, so if, you, uh, if you're familiar with um, uh, write, through on, uh, uh, write through until first flush uh, option, um, uh, right now, for us at least, it doesn't work, uh, and that's causing all kinds of uh, performance issues. So we've actually set that flag to false, uh, because our um, uh, our uh, guest uh, VMs are new enough that we have a reasonable uh, expectation that they are working properly, um, so that's uh, that's kind of weird. Um, so I wanted to talk about uh, the the third use case um, in uh, for to serve um, uh, uh, large sets of data um, using Ceph. So traditional, this is kind of a slide for traditional big data. Um, if you're familiar, familiar with like uh, MapReduce or, uh, or Spark or, or you know, traditional big data applications, um, you uh, traditionally build stuff kind of uh, in a monolithic cluster. And then uh, our current uh, big data clusters right now are just, they're, they're identical machines and uh, we have literally like clusters that have like more than a thousand machines. Um, and what that means is, it's the same machine, it has the same uh, disk configuration, um, and it runs the same exact applications uh, on every machine. And uh, uh, as you can imagine, Walmart has uh, a lot of uh, uh, big, big data. Uh, so there's, there's all kinds of uh, big data problems that we're trying to solve. Um, and, uh, and so there's uh, 
all kinds of teams that are working on these problems, right? So, and different teams can have um, uh, different requirements. And so uh, if, if it's a uh, environment where you're working on a large uh, cluster, um, uh, if some team needs uh, some specific version of some application installed on this cluster, uh, all of a sudden it's going to affect everyone else that's using this massive cluster. Uh, and so, so there's like a, there's a balance of, of doing things uh, slow enough, fast enough, um, and so that, that creates a lot of uh, challenges. So, uh, so we're trying to take this and move away from this approach and uh, kind of more towards uh, what you would see in a typical cloud environment. Um, so uh, we sort of are moving away to something that looks like this. Um, so this is a, um, uh, we, we take uh, individual uh, applications and move them into virtual machines, um, but the actual uh, bulk data that's uh, sitting uh, uh, you know, somewhere on disk is actually, we're moving that to object storage. Um, so we're using, currently we're using both uh, Swift API and uh, S3 API, um, but um, uh, I think we're gonna standardize on, on one. I'm not sure if I, we've decided on that. We currently are, are carrying uh, a bunch of patches uh, under SwiftFS, and we're, we're trying to upstream those uh, to the community. Um, so we're using things like MapReduce, Yarn, uh, you can see on the slide, Spark, uh, Presto. Um, and you see those packs, those are one-ops uh, packs that uh, Andrew was talking about before. So basically, um, this allows us to have, uh, depending on the data, we, we can have um, uh, uh, certain uh, sets of large-scale uh, big data sets that are they're 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 shared they're they're shared across multiple teams. So so it, it's a single place that sits uh, uh, you know that's stored in Ceph, and then on the object a, store on object store yeah on Swift uh, on Swift uh, Swift uh, Swift API yeah uh, obviously going through Rados gateways um, and um, uh, if a, a team needs to process that data they're gonna uh, go take that data from object store download it onto the local machine and then do the processing locally on the local machine. And then once they've finished and packaged it, they can upload it back to either their uh, uh, object storage container or some kind of uh, shared uh, container in object storage. Um, so we've, we're already doing this in production um, in small sets, uh, in small limited, uh, it's, well, I call it a production, it's, it's, it's still being tested, but, um, but it is essentially production. Um, and uh, we're, we're looking to uh, grow this uh, substantially next year. Um, I, I think um, uh, this uh, this will this will help us a lot. Um, so uh, for for this type of for object storage, uh, this is um, uh, sort of what we currently are, are doing right now. So it's same same thing. It's 120 gigs of RAM, same CPU core, just to kind of standardize. Um, we are still using 10 gigabit Ethernet for some of our older environments. Uh, we're trying to go with uh, 25 gigabit Ethernet for the newer stuff that we're building out right now. Um, uh, currently, we have, uh, depending on the server, this is roughly uh, 12 uh, uh, SATA drives. These are dense spinning drives, obviously. Uh, and we have a single NVMe device. And uh, for this, we're actually uh, doing, um, we're using NVMe device both for, for as a, like a typical traditional Ceph journal, but also uh, we're testing uh, LVM cache right now. We've, uh, we, we were testing both uh, Bcache and LVM cache. Um, unfortunately, we feel right now that uh, Bcache uh, isn't really um, something that's actively supported by the community, so we're, we're kind of uh, shying away from that. The tooling in uh, uh, LVM cache, DM cache, uh, is a lot more mature, um, and it's, it's actually been, uh, been working uh, pretty well. It almost uh, works almost out of the box. Um, uh, we, um, we see things like um, bucket indexes going to the to the to the cache um, we've actually even tested um, uh, like doing journals just going through LVM cache and they they get promoted into into the cache um, so that's something that we're still testing on and we hope to actually uh, uh, maybe share with the community uh, maybe a next next, next summit um, more specifics about that um, so some of the uh, some other challenges to serve uh, the big data use cases specifically um, so I don't know if you're paying attention to Ceph releases, but there were actually 48 uh, RGW bugs going from 10.2.2 uh, .2 .2 to 10.2.3. 
And uh, we've hit, I'm not going to say every single one of them, but it felt like we hit every single one of them. Uh, we really hit, uh, I want to say, like five or six bugs that were really brutal. And uh, at, at one point, we actually were running on uh, nightly Ceph builds in production. Uh, so, uh, so that's been uh, kind of uh, challenging and interesting for us. Um, so uh, in my past experience, we, we would have had like, uh, like I've, I've run clusters where we had like lots of uh, uh, Ceph nodes and maybe like uh, very, very few uh, RGW nodes. Uh, and so uh, we're actually uh, running into limitations on number of uh, concurrent connections uh, to the Rados gateways. Um, so we need to, we're, we're scaling horizontally. And we run uh, RGWs uh, co-located with the OSD, OSD uh, nodes. Um, so we're, we're almost scaling their RGWs horizontally uh, as, as big as the cluster. Um, also scaling for just bandwidth. Um, when you, uh, you have a you know, massive uh, Ceph cluster and just shoving everything through like a pair of RGW nodes doesn't make any sense. So, so we've hit, um, we've gone over, maybe somebody will laugh, but uh, for us it was a big deal. We, we, we were hitting more than uh, 30 gigabits uh, uh, consistent performance uh, going through Rados gateways. And so there's, you know, there's some challenges with that. Um, I think I've mentioned before the SwiftFS uh, Swift bugs. Um, we've hit lots of those and uh, we have a, a, a separate team that, uh, you know, works on big data uh, in terms of development. And um, they, they've been trying to upstream a lot of those uh, bugs into the uh, upstream uh, project. Um, I think that's about it. So just looking into the future, um, uh, we are getting more and more and more requests for file-based uh, storage, so something like Manila. Uh, we're, not, um, we're not doing that today. Um, Andrew mentioned that we're running uh, Liberty in production, so, so we're a little bit behind, I guess. Uh, so uh, we're looking into, as, as soon as we can run it as part of OpenStack, we would like to do that, but uh, right now we're not, we're not doing that in production or anywhere. Um, so we we um, we have some. Um, so we run. Uh, I think Andrew mentioned um, uh, we run Walmart.com um, in 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 OpenStack, and we are trying to move more traditional backend applications into uh, into cloud environments. Um, and uh, so that also means that we can potentially run things like something that's in a in a store. Uh, we could run in a, in a cloud environment. Maybe that doesn't make any sense, but we're sort of uh, looking into that, we're investigating that. So, so uh, potentially uh, trying to figure out storage for like a very, very small footprint. Uh, maybe next year I'll present uh, Ceph on Raspberry Pis, I don't know. Um, uh, and obviously containers is a big deal, so we don't uh, really have uh, anything in production right now, but uh, persistent storage for containers is a big deal. So um, I think that's a, uh, that's, a, that's something that the community needs, and uh, we don't have that right now. Um, am I forgetting anything? I think that's it. Uh, thanks for listening, and uh, please uh, ask questions if you have any. Yeah, we have I'll repeat the question. Um, so the question is, uh, OpenStack has a, a Swift as a project. How come we didn't use Swift uh, as the object storage for our deployment? So I think uh, some of that is historical. Um, we've, uh, we've started, uh, at least the team that, that, that we're on, um, uh, we started using Ceph uh, a while ago. Um, and uh, we sort of started with a smaller scale. And so having separate storage for block and object, um, it didn't, we didn't want to do that. Yeah, so um, the converged story of block and object, yeah. uh, especially in a, a lot of distributed locations, was uh, an attractive story for us not having to run two separate clusters. Um, uh, and, uh, and give us the, not just uh, converging, but giving us that shared storage platform, because we didn't know exactly what the growth patterns were going to look like and not having to move servers or, or reallocate between object and block. Yeah, I, uh, I, I forgot to mention, so we, we actually run, so right now we're, 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 the way we're building it out is uh, we have smaller, uh, so it kind of is the opposite of what I just said, but um, uh, we have uh, smaller uh, clusters 
Ceph clusters that are used just for block, and those are individual per OpenStack uh, environment. Um, so kind of like you know everything, uh, the um, uh, the uh, the blast radius is is limited to just that environment. But we're also running uh, larger uh, object storage clusters just for object storage, and those span. Uh, multiple uh, OpenStack environments. So they're in the same data center, but uh, multiple OpenStack environments. So, so part of it today, too, is now we have uh, um, expertise monitoring automation around Ceph, and, and we feel it's easier for us to maintain one storage platform versus uh, two. Uh, and so far, I think Ceph object storage is working for us as well. We, we like uh, the uh, uh, immediate persistency, like uh, the co immediate consistency of, of Ceph. Um, uh, in the past, we've We've had some issues with Swift uh, in terms of like troubleshooting and maintaining stuff like that. But I'm, that I'm was four plus years ago. Yeah. This is a long time ago. Yeah, this is a long time yeah. ago. Uh, so, I, but I, I, I'm not by no means a Swift expert. Um, so, uh, it's a good question. Yeah. We do, do not. The question is: Do you have data compression or dedupe in our stuff? Uh, we do not. So. Um, we do use uh, erasure coding for object storage. Um, so right now we use uh, 8 plus 3. So we're using very safe uh, J erasure uh, plugin. Um, it's so that, that uh, our replication goes from 3x uh, or 2x down to 1.375, I think. Um, we, some applications I do know uh, do compression, like uh, something like. Um, uh, the man, I'm spacing out the uh, logging elastic search, uh, elastic search or log or, or, or So the first question is, uh, what, what are some of the uh, tooling challenges we're having in the uh, operational environment around stuff? Um, so uh, just to give you a simple example, um, I, had a, I had a disk failure, and uh, someone has to log into the server, which means like you're already doing it wrong, right? Like you're, if you have to SSH into the server, right? um, uh, you have to figure out, like, is it like a is it an issue with my RAID card? Uh, is it, uh, or I shouldn't say RAID card, a controller? Um, is it, did the disk really fail? Um, is it a hardware error? Is it a software error? Um, so just troubleshooting just failures. Um, and then I've, I, I'm, I mean, that, that, that doesn't take that long, right? But then I have to deal with a, story, uh, with a server vendor that, uh, that I have to uh, get a new replacement drive in. Um, Usually that's pretty good, but sometimes I can spend almost a day. It feels like just doing that, right? So why why bother? Why do I need to Why do I need to do that? Um, so that's one challenge. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, just uh, like as you scale, you have like thousands of servers. You should be doing things. I mean, it should be a push button um, thing, like where okay, like just redo the server or something like that. Um, so I think Ceph Ansible itself is really good about the actual initial deploy. Yeah. And where we want to invest and hopefully contribute back some is about the maintenance of the cluster, right? Um, we lose a server, bring a server back in, uh, having it go through all the motions to join it back into the cluster. Those type of operational features, those are manual, are kicked off by uh, smaller Ansible scripts right now. They're not all unified into one set of operational tooling. Yeah. Yeah, maybe some something like uh, you know I, I I wanted to play around with I just haven't had time like uh, chat ops like uh, maybe like a Slack bot will will tell me hey like this cluster is having an issue uh, like you you respond to that bot by some command and it'll give you some status you don't have to like log into some interface and I can do it from my cell phone right now if I wanted to um, just simple things like that so so that's why we we do like fail in place because uh, Ceph can just keep running. Um, in my, my past life, I had a cluster that was six nodes, and it failed from six to five to four to three nodes, and I still was, was running in, in, in production. Um, so, so you can do that with stuff very easily. And the other question was, what, what uh, innovations are you looking for from the hardware vendors? Um, so like um, uh, single, single socket, finding single socket solutions uh, was hard. Um, 
uh, just more density. Um, I don't want to just have, I, I, if I'm going to let things fail in place, um, uh, I don't need uh, to swap drives, uh, you know, out of the chassis ever. Um, so, so I don't necessarily need that. There, I mean, there's lots of vendors now that do like, you know, top loading kind of drives. Uh, we're looking at smaller chassis uh, so that we can scale horizontally. So like one U servers with 12 drives or more. Um, uh, there is a vendor that was doing, uh, uh, I think it was uh, 30 drives uh, per one U. Uh, so we're, we're, we're not ready to buy into that, I think, because we want to you know, scale in smaller blocks, but, um, uh, but stuff like that. Okay, uh, one more question and then. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah, in the back. Um, our goal was. Oh, sorry, uh, let me repeat the question. What so is the typical latency what, what of VM is experiences? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Uh, so the uh, sorry. Um, so our goal was to do less than one millisecond. I think. Um, so depending on, I mean, depending on the cluster, depending on the connectivity, we can easily do less than half a millisecond. I think. Um, Ceph is pretty bad with uh, tail latencies. Uh, like as you start having issues in the cluster. Um, your tail latencies will go up, uh, so so that's that's kind of challenging. Um, if if it's a uh, properly sized cluster, um, we can pretty safely do less than one millisecond. But I don't know if that's compelling or not for for your use case. But but uh, it's it's good enough for us. All right. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, if you have any questions, you can hit us up out here afterwards or in the booth. Thanks. Uh, thank you all.